We live in an age where records can be broken for any number of weird and wonderful feats. The number of social media followers someone gains or the speed that someone can travel at. There is, however, one record which will surely never be broken. 115 years ago this week, Tottenham Hotspur lifted the FA Cup, not only winning the trophy for the first time, but also becoming the first and still to this day only non-league team ever to win that cup. A record which will surely last long after most records have fallen. Try telling that team we shouldn't be taking the cup seriously. This is your Eastburs podcast. Come on, Hi guys, welcome to your eSports podcast. As always, your weekly fix of all things THFC. Whether you're a regular listener or joining us for the first time this week, guys, welcome to the eSports podcast. And don't forget to subscribe via iTunes or if you prefer on Acast and get every new episode direct as and when it's released. We're also across the social media platforms on Twitter, Instagram at E underscore Spurs and check out and like us on Facebook. Uh, the address for that is facebook.com forward slash E Spurs page. Uh, we're also on Google Plus, YouTube, Pinterest, Tumblr, the lot. So for all of the links, as I always say, for the E Spurs platforms, head to our website, which you'll find at www.espurs, all one word, dot blogspot, dot co. UK. Tonight on the East Spurs podcast, we'll look back at what might have been against West Brom. I'll be putting your social media questions to the panel on all things THFC. And to finish, we'll preview our third, yes, third Monday night game in a row against Chelsea at the Bridge next week. So before we talk Tottenham, just to let you know uh, a couple of reminders, guys. The East Spurs website is currently looking to add new writers to our existing team. So whether or not you're a serious writer or a fan looking for a new hobby, get in touch with us. We're looking for writers to provide us with opinion pieces, match reviews and previews. So if all that sounds like something that you'd be interested in, get in touch. Um, the address to uh, contact us by email is e-spurs at live.co.uk. So if you fancy yourself as a bit of a writer, um, regardless of experience, give us a, an email e-spurs at live.co.uk. Also due to us playing on Monday again this week, the Spurs talking point will now go out on Saturday this week as it did last week, not the usual Thursday. So don't forget to catch that on Saturday this week on our Extra Time show. Um, this week we'll be asking whether Kane's goals or Alderweireld's defending has had a bigger impact on our season. So don't forget to catch that one on Saturday. Uh, so to kick off the podcast tonight, let's introduce the three Spurs fans ready to take us through the next 45. It's Ricky, John and Ian. How you doing, lads? All good, mate. All good. You all right? Yeah, great stuff, mate. Great, great to have everybody on as always. Ricky and Ian, good uh, good weekend? Very good, mate. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, all good. Thanks, and All good. Great stuff, lads. Um, John, help me out here, mate, because I'm, I'm sort of torn here. How, how should I be feeling, John? Because, I mean, we just played West Brom. We're second in the league. Um, my body doesn't know which way it's going at the moment. Should I be happy with second or should I be disappointed at possibly now missing out on the title? How should I feel, mate? I think however you do feel, as long as there's a, an undercurrent of absolute pride, then it doesn't really matter either way because we're, we're all disappointed that we didn't win on Monday, of course. But, you know, you take the emotions of the, of the game itself on Monday out of the equation. It's just, I'm still so proud. Yeah. Of what this what this manager and group of players have achieved this season and made the fans even to even to get the fans to believe uh, finishing more higher than fifth was possible, you know, because I weren't sure t- to tell you the truth at the start <laughs> of the season that we would better last season. But you know, I keep trying to maintain my feelings on this season from how I felt at the beginning of it, and I I still see this as a, a season where we have overachieved I- I- in my opinion, but. Saying that, it's still, it just, I'm just so proud of, I'm just proud to support Tottenham again because there was a, there was a period a couple of years ago where it felt so disconnected and you felt the players didn't care. We had a bit of a donut as a manager and it just, <laughs> I, I'd never felt that way before. In you know, I'm 30 years old, in all that time of supporting Tottenham, I never felt that disconnected. And now, you know, you see the players like Kyle Walker was flat out on the pitch on Monday night and Toby looked like he was shedding a tear and you just just makes me proud of, proud to be a Tottenham fan and proud of the club, you know. And I think that as long as, for the majority of us, that's the overriding feeling come the end of the season, then, you know, the boys have done good. Yeah, and 
I mean, earlier on, John, you was telling us, I mean, you was there at the game, Ricky was there, Ian was there at the game, and you was telling us about the atmosphere after the match, not just during, but also after the game was something that you've never really experienced before. Yeah, I mean, in previous seasons, that final whistle probably would have been met with a chorus of boos. But this time, it, 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 it just, you know, like I was just saying, the feel around the club is so different. There's nothing but support from the terraces, you know, mm. for the players and for the club. And I, I, I put a tweet out the day after. I, I, I well, I, I'm not ashamed to admit, I welled up a little bit singing yeah. "We Love You, Tottenham" at the final whistle, just because one, because I'm um, one, because I mean it, and two, because I just felt for the players because they sort of, I mean, they realised how important a win would have been and how important it might end up being that we didn't get the win. And they, they sort of, they're not like big time Charlies who don't care about the club and and the fans and you know they, because th- their reaction at the end showed that you know they're not what did what did Alan Sugar famously say they're not a bunch of Carlos kicker balls are they yeah, which is no, for the funny me. I'd like to think that the players are you know they would have heard what the fans were singing and let's hope that that, that keeps them going and spurs them on through to the end of the season and no matter what happens now and where we finish you know we are proud of this bunch of players and we are we're all proud of the club again it's just it's nice to be a part of it at the minute yeah, it is. And I, you know, I can't, I just can't be disappointed with this team. I just, and look, there's no worse loser in the world than me. I'm, I'm, I tell you what, I sulk for Britain when Spurs lose, um, whether it be PlayStation or the real thing, you know, there's, I, I hate it um, with a passion. Having said that, I just, uh, even after Monday night, I felt, you just feel a sense of pride watching the players after the game um, and looking back over the season. It's There's just so much there to look forward to. And we, we've spoken about Leicester, haven't we? And it, it is frustrating. Rick, That that that's the big frustration, I think, isn't it? And that's what's dividing um, many Spurs fans' emotions at the moment is, is the fact that it's it's Leicester. And as we said, not not a Man United, a Chelsea. And that makes does make a difference. Of course, yeah. I think that's the hardest thing to accept. Um Listen, I have to say, just a touch on the atmosphere. I watched the Man City game last night. Now, that was Man City's first appearance um, in a Champions League semi-final. And I don't think I'm being over the top here when the boys were at the White Hart Lane the other night. Tottenham's atmosphere, it was 10 times the atmosphere for Manchester City in their first ever Champions League semi-final. Yeah. White Hart Lane was absolutely rocking. And I just felt the players, the Spurs players this season have been absolutely magnificent, tremendous. I can't possibly fault them this campaign. You can count on your hand, I wouldn't say bad performances, bad first half performances maybe, maybe West Ham away. But apart from that, I don't really can call too many games where we haven't turned up. And I just think the pressure told on us, if I'm being completely honest with you, Andy, and I know many people said that, you know, the fact maybe Leicester playing, you know, won't have a, you know, Leicester playing ahead of us or before us won't have a difference on proceedings. Personally, I thought it did. Mm. I think the pressure, you could, you could feel it. And 1-0 being a Spurs fan, anyone will tell you, even if you're 2-0 free up as a Tottenham fan going into the last 10 minutes of a game, you would think that's safe. But as a Spurs fan, they'll tell you, it's never, <laughs> it's never safe as a Spurs fan. So he always knew 1-0 was always going to be um, a very, very, how to put it, you know, a risky scoreline. Yeah. There was always that chance of conceding and it was to a set piece. Um, and it's so hard to be so critical of Hugo because he's been immense this season mm. and you can count the amount of points he's saved us. Um, but I'm sure he will be disappointed in terms of the goal where he came out and it's so unlike him. He's normally so commanding of his box and normally gets it right. But listen, he made a mistake. It's one of those things. He saved us a couple of seconds before with a stunning save from Rondon. Um, but I just felt that, again, I, like I just said, the, the pressure told. Um, but the fans were absolutely magnificent. Throughout the game, they were patient, waiting for the goal to come. Even after we conceded, it was straight away. Fans got straight back up. Come on, you Spurs. Delivered, you know, the crowd. It really was like a kind of encore to say, come on, we can still do this. Yeah. And we definitely got knocked back. 100% we got knocked back. And we kept on trying and persisting. And I think like we spoke off air. Unfortunately, when you hit the bar on the post two or three times in a night, going along also with with the time wasting. I mean, I'm sure the fans, like many of us, picked up on it. Even from the opening 10 minutes, you know, mm-hmm. West Brom's intention to waste time was a joke. And West Brom are safe in the league. That's what I found so hard. But you know what you're going to get from Tony Pulis' sides. I think the hardest thing to accept is the fact that West Brom turned up and gave it their all 
to get a result on the Monday, whereas we refer back to Leicester on the Sunday and Swansea basically gift wrapped them the game. Yeah. And that's a hard thing to accept. But for me personally, I have to say that this Tottenham team, without fault, broken teams down, we've dominated, dismantled sides. In my eyes, they are my champions. And I have to say, if Leicester go on to win it, I will say congratulations to them. But in my eyes, I don't know how many Tottenham fans feel, I feel that we are the forgotten fairy tale this season. That's how I personally feel. Yeah, I, I think most, you know, if pe- most people look at it logically um, without emotion, I think most people would, would certainly agree with that. It's just, I mean, a lot of people have got carried away on this wave of, of Leicester, you know, and this so-called fairy tale, haven't they? And it, it's a lot of it is, is, is over the top. And unfortunately, it's it's us as Spurs fans that have been on the receiving end because we're the only team chasing them. Um, and to a certain extent, a lot of our football and a lot of our wins have been ignored because Leicester have been... But but as you say there, Rick, quite rightly, once again, you know, Leicester um, are defending a set piece, the ball rebounds off two posts, hit Casper Michael and then into his arms. Whereas with us, you know, it goes against us, those sorts of things, you know. So I do feel, and it, it might sound like sour grapes to a lot of people, and to be honest, I'm at the stage now, this, this so-called title race, where I don't really care, to be honest, you know, because I genuinely do think we've been on the receiving end of some very bad bad misfortune um i do think also we need to be a little bit more clinical in certain positions but um leicester have, have certainly had the rub of the green in every single way possible haven't they um teams have just they they have rolled over and you know i defy anyone to uh to, to prove prove otherwise because i mean just look at swansea's performance it was abject you know abject um ian in terms of the game going back to the game itself I mean, how do you explain us going from beating a team like Stoke away from home 4-0 and then coming back home where you think we're, we're back at a you know, fortress, we've hardly lost there this season, and then we end up with a result like that? How, how, does that, um, how do you explain that one? I think when we talk about the game on Monday, I think we have to give West Brom a great deal of credit for the way they set their game plan up. Yeah. They had the, you know, they set up to a avoid or deny us the space that we normally use to play into and I think that they'd targeted Deli Alley early and, and some of our flair players um, you know and tried to unsettle them and I think as the game progressed we got more into trying to combat their game rather than playing our own mm. and I think I think if we look at the stats overall, in the end, I think West Brom probably deserved their point. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think you will always get that with a, with a Tony Pulis-inspired uh, team. I don't think he gives any freebies no. to, to anybody. And I think that, I think if we look at it, I think they got a point at, uh, at, at Leicester, didn't they? So it, it, it wasn't as if we, we shouldn't have found it being a surprise to come up against a well-organised team who were prepared to, to, to battle us and, and not to, to roll over and just give us the three points. No, absolutely. You, we got what we expected. And, and looking at things, again, from the outside, it's no disgrace, is it, drawing against West Brom. I think it's the, the circumstances that, that are, are so frustrating, aren't they, in, in terms of being so close. However, Ian, are you going to tell me that we're not out of the title race yet? I, I don't think we are. I think that, you know, mathematically, you know, Leicester still need to get three points. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Manchester United, who are their next opponents, are desperate for a top four finish. Um, Not sure, not too sure about Leicester, but they might want to up their game against a team that's but that that is potentially going to be the English champions and do it for, for, for Martinez. And who knows what Chelsea team they're going to get? Because if you listen to uh, Fabregas, they're, they're just going to roll over. So, but you know, for, for, from my point of view, if if we win, if we win all our next three games and Leicester draw all of theirs, then by nature of mathematics and goals scored, we win it. I l- listen, I, l- I love the way you think. I love the way you think. Part of me feels. It, it was almost on Monday night. I was as proud as punch seeing them players after the game, the way they reacted. In some ways, having said that, it was almost a relief in terms of the torture that we've been through um, the last few weeks. Um, in, in that, 
we can almost forget about the title and, and concentrate on this Champions League now, which we've almost got sewn up. Um, yeah. Because it has been a, such a roller coaster, hasn't it? And, you know, it, it's the first time we've in our lifetimes been in this situation of going for the title. So it's all new to us as it is to Leicester. And it, it has been torched to a certain extent because, as you say there, we, we've been playing second uh, each and every time. So we've always been playing catch up, which makes it yeah. that much harder. Um, and, and to a certain extent, and again, it will sound like, you know, um, a little bit sour grapes, but I do feel that there's been a lot of... Um, a lot more support for Leicester, as you might expect, than, than there has for us. I think there's been a, um, a huge wave of support for Leicester and a will almost for Spurs to, to slip up, which which adds another layer of torture on top of the uh, the pressure that's, that was already there. So it's been, in some ways, and I do say this um, delicately because, of course, I would love more than anything for Spurs to have won the league, but in some ways it was almost a relief um, that we almost now know where, where we... Uh, where we stand and what what the goal is um, now. Having said that, who knows? As you say, Ian, let's let's hope. You know, it's such a long way to go. Ricky, is of Chelsea the key for you still? Yeah, uh, Chelsea really. Uh, again, I have to say that. I mean, they held all the cards a couple of weeks ago because if we won our games, um, I was still adamant that I couldn't see Leicester winning all of theirs. But I mean, as everyone knows, I am the most optimistic positive Tottenham fan there is. But um, I feel exactly the same as you, Andy, in a way that it would be absolutely heartbreaking if it went to the final day for us to have lost it then. Yeah. That would have been unbearable after what we've gone through over the years with the lasagna gate, with obviously losing to Arsenal out in the Champions League more than one occasion. With Chelsea, obviously in the Champions League, we lost the Champions League place then. To have it... To have this in terms of the league taken away from us on the final day would just be, well, I don't want to think about that. That would be absolute torture. So when you say, Andy, that, you know, delicately, you know, it's a relief, I have to agree with you. Um, but Ian's right. It's mathematically still possible. My head tell, my head tells me it's over. My heart does say there's a glimmer of, glimmer of hope. But we've already heard Chelsea have, you know, players from the team, Hazard and Farragas, have said they don't want Spurs to win it. And it seems like they are going to roll over for Leicester um, if it is going to go down to the last game and, you know, both teams are in it. But I think what does need to be made a point of is that the, the title wasn't lost for me against West Brom. It, it was lost before that. We had two opportunities to go top, as we both know in the past. We had West Ham away. Uh, we had the Arsenal game. And both of those opportunities could have seen us hit top. Mm. Now, we only took two points out of six from those games. And the Arsenal game, we played well. But we, f- we have to be honest and say we faded off towards the end of that fixture. And we're lucky in, lucky in the end to get the point. And the West Ham game, I think, in re- you know, going back to that game, Spurs were outspurred in that, in that first half from West Ham. They did play really, really well. And second half, we came back into it. And that's really the only game, the West Ham game, the first half, I can say that we didn't turn up this season. I'm struggling to remember games where we haven't turned up. But then I'm reminded that we've actually, I didn't realise this, we've dropped eight points from winning positions at home. So we might have got, you know, got 19 points recovered in terms of going from losing positions. But to lose eight points from winning positions at home, I don't know many teams that win the league that do drop that amount of points. And we know that our start to the season wasn't the greatest you know Kane was struggling to find form we all knew he would come good don't get me wrong we all knew he would come good but as Spurs fans we can pinpoint the games in which we know really we lost points you know we know that so I don't think really we can have any complaints overall it's been a fantastic season the pride is gleaming like John said it there's such a great pride about being Spurs I've never felt such a connection that I do now to them before there is that identity. And what makes this even sweeter is that Arsenal fans that have been bitter. What made me laugh is that it's like on social media um, friends, Arsenal fans say, no, you've blown the league. Well, the fact is Arsenal were top and Arsenal dropped from third. Spurs have been second majority of the season. We haven't, we haven't bottled it. We've maintained our position and we still can do it. And it's been a phenomenal, phenomenal ride. Um, yeah, it's been phenomenal. And I don't think 
anything will detract away from what a special season this has been to be a Spurs fan. And I've loved every single minute of it, whatever happens. Yeah, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head there, Rick. If you look at the crowd at the Emirates the other night, I think that pretty much says it all, doesn't it? About the, the support, in inverted commas, that you know they provide for their team. Whereas we're playing you know, against a, a mid, middle-of-the-table club in West Brom, packed out again, sold out again. Yeah, totally agree. And, Absolutely uh, agree with you. You know, it's, it's great to see. John, just to finish up on the uh, talk of the the, 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 the game on, on Monday night, I want, to ask you, I want to ask you this. It's water under the bridge to a certain extent, and there's nothing we can do about it now. Having said that, I want to ask, should Sky have been allowed to schedule three Spurs games in a row on Monday nights, um, considering our rivals for the title were also scheduled by Sky three Saturdays in a row um, for television reasons. I'm not sure the input that Spurs have on on uh, whether or not they they have to agree to these fixtures um, before they're they're you know signed off by Sky um, or whether or not Sky have the final say. But should the FA or the Premier League or, or, or does it not matter? What's your view on it? Well, it's a pain in the arse for me because I have to get up at half four in the morning for work. <laughs> <laughs> so you certainly wouldn't have signed for it. <laughs> no, but I think what it is, is obviously the, the club probably make extra money out of having all these televised games. So from a business point of view, I would imagine it makes sense. But I mean, I don't really think it makes much difference because it's not only these three games where we've played after they have. You know, we've been doing it all season because of being in Europe and... Mm. You know, so I, I, guess, I, think... I mean, I guess what what the question really was was at such a crucial time, and without our, you know, with it being just two teams in the title race, and our rival being given the first slot three weeks in a row, um, should that have been allowed to happen? And you know, in in terms of competition, um, should the Premier League have maybe have tried to mix things up a little bit more? I understand what you're saying, but I just think maybe, I mean, the, the title race wouldn't have been as clear cut, you'd imagine, when that decision was made in the first place, you know. So, yeah. possibly, it, it, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was done with any sort of malicious intent or any intent to harm Tottenham's chances because, you know, I, I always find it, it's like when you're <clears throat> playing in Europe in a two-legged tie, I'd always want to play at home second. So, I think it, it's, it's kind of like that every weekend. It's like, right. So if you treat the Leicester game as the first leg, you see what I'm saying? So we know what we've got to do the following day. Mm, yeah. And I think, you know, for the, for the group of players that we've got, it probably do, it will do them good in the long run because, the, you know, especially at the, the tender age that most of our players are, to be able to deal with that kind of pressure and expectancy and to still be thriving in that situation. Let's, let's, you know, we've lost one in 12. We haven't, we haven't dropped a place in the league since match day eight. Yeah. So, you know, we've only either gone, stayed where we are or gone up in the league since the eighth game of the season. So when you look at it like that, I personally think it makes no difference. And all the, I mean, I know the players are not going to come out and say anything other than, you know, we're just concentrating on what we're doing, blah, blah, blah. But I do believe that they feel that way. They're not going to be affected by it. I would, you know, I'd like to think that they just, they're professional, you know, they're not, they're not like the Chelsea players who are clearly are not with, you know, some of the things they've been saying, but... <laughs> I think that it, it, they're just a, a young, honest group of players who just love playing football and yeah. really that's all that matters to them. And I think, you know, it, it probably does these players good to have the spotlight thrust upon them. And like I said, none of them are throws. It, it's, not like, it's not like it's affecting performances. And you've had a lot of our players who have had their best seasons for us this season. Yeah. Players who were frozen in the past, Dembele, Lamella, for example. When the going's got tough, they've been nowhere to be found. Whereas this season, it's not been the case, and especially recently. Let's. I'll tell you what, lads. Should we do some questions? Let's um, open up another can of worms and get the questions from our followers on social media, the Twitter and the Facebook. You guys once again have been great in sending in your questions for the East Spurs team via Twitter, Facebook, um, all the other platforms that, that we use out there. First up tonight from Marcus Aurelius um, at. Mag Gukian and he asks about Deli Ali, and we all know now that Deli Ali has obviously been punished for the incident in the game. Um, he asked Rick if you curb Ali's enthusiasm, will it curb his spark and somehow affect his talent? I most certainly think it does. I don't think you can afford to take that side of Devon out of his game because it does play a massive part of who he is as a player. I think we've seen that this season. Um, in the past at Spurs, we've had players that have been a bit too nice. Um, have been allowed to get bullied across the pitch. Yeah. And certainly with Ali and with Dyer, two players that 
that doesn't happen. But what Tony Pulis did do on Monday night was he he played right into into his hands, if you like, because Yakov is one of those kind of players that if you look, you know, throughout this season, he's a yellow card kind of player. Yeah, he's used to doing a job on a player and he'd done the job on Ali and he frustrated him. And from the start, he was on his case, niggling away, cheap fouls given, just to kind of tell him, look, I'm here and I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm here to annoy you all game. Should the referee not... maybe have stepped in before Rick and calmed the situation down? Because Jakob was, was throughout the game, wasn't he? Niggly fouls here and there. Well, I agree with that, but there also has to be a certain common sense from Ali. I know he's young. He's shown a lot of maturity this season in certain situations. And there was this one here where I just thought Poch maybe at half time might have said a word with Ali to say, look, you know, control yourself because in reality, this isn't, it can happen, you know, and it was a silly, silly thing to do. And in the game, if it was seen, it would have been a straight red card and we could have lost the game. Um, having said that, it's going to cost us now. I understand he's accepted the charge. So it's going to be the three games. We're going to lose him and, Listen, as a player, he is, for me, he's irreplaceable. So whoever we're bringing in, it's going to be a problem because what Ali does bring to Spurs this in this team, which arguing I would say other players don't, is he carries the ball. He carries the ball forward. I mean, you can argue sometimes Lamella does that. But Ali has that kind of confidence, that fearless kind of side to him where he will bring the ball out and will go forward and drive with it. And the opposition are scared of him. They're, un- they're scared of him because of his unpredictability in terms of what he can do on the ball. And we're going to definitely miss him. We are. But I really hope for him as a player, it's a learning curve. Because next season, and it's going to happen the same again. Every team, now this has been done, he's not going to play again until next season. There'll be other opposition managers like Tony Poulis in the, uh, in the player's ear, like a Charlie Adam, like we've seen with Yakov, to say, look, if you get him, he will react yeah. and it will cost dearly. And it, unfortunately, listen, I'm not going to blame the kid because he is young. He's got a lot to learn. Um, it's one of those situations where all you can do is hope he learns from it. It was a stupid thing to do. And you know as a player now that there's so many cameras around. You just can't do that nowadays. You really can't. You, you know, in the past, you get away with it. Now, in terms of the FA being able to give the kind of retrospective action, you are going to be found punished you know, at your peril. So let's hope he learns from it. But nothing can take away from a fabulous season he's had. And if it is over for him, then what a fabulous first season he's had at Spurs and hopefully many more to come. Absolutely. How do you, Rick, how do you get that balance right? How do you keep the fire in Deli Ali's belly, but stop him from going out, going over the top like he did on, on Monday? Um, but how do you do it in a way that keeps the boy um, on side? It's a difficult one for the manager, isn't it? I think a lot of it, if I'm being honest with you, Andy, comes down to his age. I think this might not be a bad thing, the fact that he's going to miss these. Obviously, it's going, to be a bad, it's going to be a bad thing for us as a team. But for him as a person, as a player, it might not necessarily be a bad thing. Because I'll put this to you. If for some kind of a miracle, Leicester do not get the result required on Saturday or the following week, um, and it goes to the final day, and miraculously somehow we win this Premier League, which would be miraculous and Ali was to miss out because of the ban, how would he feel not being part of it on the final day in terms of playing? Yeah. I know that is a very, very, that's very, very far-fetched to go that far and extreme, but certain things have to happen as a player for you to notice and realise where you've made a mistake and for you to learn it. And I can say, repeat again, I certainly don't want to take out this side to his game because I believe this is what makes a difference from him being an average player to having those moments of brilliance in his game, that bit of devilment inside. So you most certainly can't take it out of his game, but what you must do is try and find a way to curb it. And for me, in Pochettino, he's got the perfect manager because Poch isn't just, you know, uh, uh, just the word of manager. He's a coach. Yeah. He will coach him. He will teach him that, unfortunately, you can't do that on a football pitch, what he's done, because it will be picked up. So he will learn. I've got no doubt about it. He'll come back a stronger player. But like I've said, if his season ends here, he's had a fabulous, fabulous season. And there's not been many regrets to his game this season. Absolutely not. I love, you know, love the player to bits. I think he's, he's, he's a winner, isn't he? He's, I think that's, that's where the fire in his belly comes from, that desire to win. I think, um, you know, 
it just as you say curbing that enthusiasm which will come i'm sure over time um because i think he, he's got the right manager there pochettino has been mentioned not just by ali as a father figure you know but by quite a few of the players now as being that sort of you know manager coach um to, to look after the players he puts an arm around them you know talks to them and i think he's, he's absolutely the right person from what from what we hear so you know delhi ali if if the season ends here then you know thank you it's been been a fantastic one um Final question of the night, and this goes to John. Um, and it's an interesting one. It's about the stadium and, and the possible move to Wembley, John. He asked, will the move to Wembley for a year be a good or bad thing in terms of results? That's a good question. I mean, in terms of the opposition, they might find that extra 10%, you know, because they're, they're playing at Wembley. <laughs> but I think possibly it will be, as long as our players adjust to it quickly, I don't think it will make too much difference. I think... You know the way we've been playing this season. If we continue to progress as we are, we could, you know, we could play on the on the Sunday Park and stuff, <laughs> most teams. Uh, but I, I think again, it'll be the same when we move into the new stadium. As long as we can adjust to it quickly and get used to our new surroundings, it, I, I can't see it being too much of an issue. You go to a lot of the games yourself, John. So w- would you be in favour of a Wembley or a MK Dons? Well, I certainly wouldn't be travelling to Milton Keynes if it was a, a Monday night. No. So I think for me personally, it takes about the same amount of time to get to White Hart Lane as it does to get to Wembley. So I would certainly welcome uh, Wembley if it was, you know, for a, a temporary home as opposed to Milton Keynes. But on on that, on the question, a little bit veering away from it a little bit, but I'm, I'm still in the same ballpark. If next season we end up having to make a decision of playing at White Hart Lane with a reduced capacity which has been touted or playing at Wembley, for, especially in the Champions League, I do think that would make a massive difference. And I would personally, as much as it would be nice to have Champions League football at Wild Lane you know, one more time, I think that if, if, the, if the Wembley was available for our European games next season, I'd certainly be in favour of playing at Wembley in front of 50,000 fans for Champions League games. because One, because it gives you more opportunity to get tickets. And two, you know, it, it sort of kind of preparation for when we do have more seats to fill. And I'm pretty confident that there are not going to be games where, you know, you, you, the the stadium's not full or close to full, you know, because yeah. there's all, you know, I know that uh, Ricky's had to rely on StubHub and a few other sources so far this season and, you know, try and get tickets that way. And I'm, I, I hate StubHub, but I think it's one of those things where supply and demand, hopefully, and we'll find out whether, you know, whether we can fill it, which I'm sure we can. I just hope that we get this situation's resolved pretty quickly because I, I personally, like I say, I wouldn't want to play at White Lane in the Champions League with like 28,000 or whatever it would be, with, you know, if the Paxton Road stand was not in use. But, yeah, now going forward, I think Wembley's, Wembley's probably the best solution for the club and certainly a, a move I would welcome. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I think I, I think I remember hearing that there's a cap on the number of, of, of spectators Wembley are allowed to have. So, for example, if we play there the season after next in the league, I think I'm right in saying we're only allowed fifty thousand capacity there. So there will be, yeah, you would you would think a whole tier empty, which might lead to a bit of a weird, weird atmosphere um, in in some ways. Uh, but it'd be certainly be interesting to have those Champions League games there. Um, and and you would you would guess that most Spurs fans, rather than play in front of you know twenty eight twenty eight thousand, would would have a larger capacity, more of a chance to see the team play in the Champions League. Um, be interesting. Maybe another one for a talking point there. Maybe we'll get that one on. Well, I'd be I'd be more confident that the empty red seats at Wembley would make more noise than they do at the Emirates. <laughs> so if we was to, even if there was a whole the whole upper bowl of Wembley empty, I don't think it would make too much difference in terms of the amount of noise generated because, you know, I've been to plenty of England games at the at the new Wembley and it, it is uh, the ground is built. With, with atmosphere in mind and it's you know when the crowd gets going it is conducive to a, a decent atmosphere and it, you can make noise in there and it, it does echo around the place and it, it's a it's an it's an it is a nice ground in which to watch football as well it's not um you know there's always a toilet <laughs> <laughs> you know you don't have to you don't have to go and queue up for a cup of tea after 35 minutes to make sure you get one to be back in time for the start of the second half and just little things like that that make the, I don't know, the, I suppose the consumer experience, as much as I hate that kind of phrase, more, you know, more it's more fan friendly there. So I think the, the attendances would probably suffer if we went to Milton Keynes because I think there's a lot of, you know, Spurs are not really a club where, you know, I'm in Kent 
and there's probably more Liverpool Man United fans in Kent than there are in Manchester and Liverpool. <laughs> Whereas with Tottenham, I don't think we're one of those clubs that you know a lot of our fans are South Eastern based. Yeah. You know, so you don't you don't hear many Northern accents on a match day at White Lane from the home <laughs> supporters. Let's put it that way. So I think yeah, definitely the closer to home the better for me. Yeah, absolutely. It would be it'd certainly be a nice experience playing at Wembley for a season or, or or maybe two. I'll tell you what, John, though, I'd be careful mentioning fan experience. You'll have the trust after you soon, offer, offering you a job if you carry on like that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, lads, that's the questions for tonight. I hope everybody who's asked a question this week has had their, their question answered by the lads. They've done their best to uh, get those answers to you. Um, if you do want to pose a question to any of our team, don't forget to get in touch with us at E underscore Spurs on Twitter or the Facebook E Spurs page, and we'll get those over and across to our team each week as we did tonight. Um, let's move on to the final part of the podcast tonight, guys, which is, of course, the preview for the Chelsea game coming up on Monday night. Spurs have lost just one of their last 10 Premier League London derbies. So my question is, Rick, can we win at Chelsea for the first time since February 1990? Of course we can. Win at Chelsea for that for, for our first time since God knows how long. Um, <laughs> but my biggest concern is really that for them, this is their cup final. Yeah, they haven't, they haven't had many cup finals this season <laughs> in terms of teams to face. But really, they're up for this Chelsea. Um, they really, really are. Uh, I don't know many seasons where I wouldn't say we're favourites going to Stamford Bridge, but it's certainly the best Spurs team. We've had going to Stamford Bridge since I, I couldn't tell you. It's been such a, such a long time. But nothing to fear for us. We've proven that away at Man City this season, at Liverpool, at Arsenal. You know, We've gone to tough away games and got points. One at Man City where no one expected us to win. And it would be the same here, where even still, despite where we are in the league and our position and where Chelsea are... Um, the impact Hiddink has made, I think he's only lost one Premier League game. It would still be a surprise to see Spurs go there and win. So I wouldn't be surprised to see us go there and win because of the Tottenham side we've watched this season and how we've played. Yeah. It wouldn't be a surprise to Spurs fans. Um, but Chelsea are going to be so up so up for this. And again, we look back at it and say, you know, if we were still in the title race, we wouldn't want them not singing to us, you know, you nearly <laughs> won the league. So it'll be interesting to see, like John said, the state of play when we go into this game in terms of what do we need because we know we're only a couple of points off automatic Champions League let alone Champions League as a whole in terms of going straight through to the group stages so it will be very very interesting to see the state of play as to where we're at but um, I'm excited I'm looking forward to it as I'm sure all the Tottenham fans are um, and I'm sure the players are as well don't forget the players as much as it's hard as, as a supporter to try and raise yourself um of the disappointment. It must be hard for a player as well when you're involved in it. Um, and obviously we've kicked, we've chanted, we've screamed with them every every ball. <laughs> you know, the support has been magnificent this season. It really, really has. And I feel like John said, we are all in this together. We are one big family. So I'm sure the players have had to, have been raised by Poch. I'm sure he's had to say to them, look, there's still a lot to play for this season, no matter what, you know, we shouldn't just take for granted finishing above Arsenal first time in 20 years that that shouldn't be taken for granted and that we need to do that we still need to sew that up that's not mathematically done yet and I'm sure there'll be Spurs fans that are like me that will still think in the summer when it's done have we done it <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it still will be a great achievement when you look at the resources Arsenal have plunged into their squad yeah and you look at where Spurs have come from in terms of the players that have come through the identity Potter's brought the very little money spent it's a magnificent achievement and I don't want that to be you know I don't want that to be overshadowed in a way because people need to look at the bigger picture here. The difference between Spurs and Leicester is Leicester, it's a freak for me. Yeah. Like we said off air, I don't see Leicester next season winning the Premier League. I'd even think it's questionable if they make the top six. And I will say that even in the summer, when the players have come available, if there's a Spurs scout and a Leicester scout going after a player, the player, I would say, nine times out of ten more is going to look at Spurs more than he'll look at Leicester. Yeah. And those fans, Leicester fans, I've had a lot of abuse on social media from then, calling me bitter, um, calling me biased. I am just seeing it as it is. I've watched Spurs 38 times this season. I've seen Leicester on match of the day. All right, I've seen 20 minute clips of them for the past, you know, 36, 34, 35 games, and I think we've played the best football. 
Uh, that's my opinion. Leicester have played the most effective football. Yes, that can't be questioned. Yes, they've grinded out results. But I've watched Spurs, we've watched Spurs on a weekly basis, dismantle, you know, outfire, outfought teams, break teams down, turn around games where we didn't think they'd turn around, recover the most points, score the most goals, have the best defensive record. These stats should count for something. They shouldn't just be forgotten just because the media might want to run away with Leicester being the fairy tale. Because really, this Spurs team are here to stay. Next season, we are already, for, in my opinion, we are a season ahead of the likes of Liverpool, of Man City, of Chelsea, of United. They're all going to get new managers in. Klopp's in there a second season. He's still got to buy players and bring them into the squad and get them to settle. With Spurs, how many times can we say in the last, I don't know, 10 years that we really only need at best two, three players? Yeah. We don't need any more than that, if I'm being completely honest with you, Andy. We know that as Spurs fans, because we've already got one of the best 11s there is in the Premier League. So what you're looking now for is that we're looking for players to come in and they need to understand that you aren't guaranteed a place in this Tottenham side. It doesn't matter how good you are. Yeah, spot on, Rick. And, you know, it is all about being positive and no regrets, I think, is the is the big point here, isn't it? You know, don't don't look back and think what if. I think if you focus more on those stats that you, you mentioned there, Rick, the, the best goals, the least conceded, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and the list does go on, um, then I think that really puts everything into perspective, doesn't it, as a Spurs fan? Um it's just been a been a great season. You mentioned strikers, Rick. Harry Kane, our very own, is just two goals away now from getting 50 Premier League goals. Um, and if he gets it in the Chelsea game, he'll be the eighth quickest player to score 50 in the competition. Um, so another record that, you know, is, is close to being achieved. Harry Kane's 50th Premier League guy if he gets two in that game. And it would also, it would also, something which would be quite sweet, if we were to win at Stamford Bridge, it would be Chelsea's 200th Premier League defeat. So if they need any motivation, there you go. Um, Ian, in terms of the game and winning the game, do you think we need to, although we're going away from home, do we need to change our game in any way? Or is it a case of us turning up as possibly the favourites and asserting ourselves on Chelsea? No, I, I think we turn up and we assert ourselves on what is in effect a mid-table side. Yeah. I think it's going to be a difficult game. But I think if we turn up with the same intent and desire that we showed against Stoke, then... I can only see one one possible outcome, and that's an extension of of the, the the records that keep tumbling for the team and Harry Kane this this season, um, and 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 a, and a landmark loss for Chelsea. So, no, I I think we go there. Um, we're upbeat. We play our game, um, and and I think that um, you, you know I think we might just 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 scrape a, a positive result out of it. And it's it's that sort of time, isn't it? Now, when you look at the game, John, and Chelsea, for all their troubles this season, they've still, in the last few months under the new manager, they've put together some decent results. They haven't blown anyone away, but they've shown that they do still have players in there capable of producing. So should we be wary of anything that Chelsea have to throw, throw us on, on Monday? On paper, if you didn't know where the two teams were, you know, they've still got a pretty impressive team. Yeah. Even without Courtois, I think he's still banned, so Begovic will play. And but I think I'm. I don't want to say I'm not worried about them because they are a mid-table team, like Ian <laughs> just said. And we're you know we're still going for the league, so I think it, it's it will say it will show a lot about uh, the belief that our players maybe still have. I'm not too worried about how they see it or what or our Chelsea, you know, whether Chelsea want us to win the league or not. Ultimately, if if their players are going to be up for it. <clears throat> then our players should be even more so, shouldn't they? Because yeah. we've still got stuff to play for, whereas their season has finished. So, <clears throat> you know, we'll see. We'll see. Obviously, the result the day before uh, the Leicester Man United game dep- will obviously could either seal our fate or not. So we'll see that it could be very much alive for us still. The only thing, the only worrying thing about that is, of course, that might give Chelsea extra motivation because if we was to lose there, even if Leicester lose, then th- then it's done, isn't it? So yeah. I think it, it, it's, but then, like I said earlier, this, this is a sort of situation I've longed to be in as a Tottenham fan to have these kind of <laughs> worries and this kind of stress for so long. So I don't know. I think I, I mean I'm more than confident that our players can cope with the occasion and cope with Chelsea because you know, like we said, if we turn up and play like we did or like we have been 
all season pretty much, you know. Then we've got we've got a, a very very good chance of turning them over, and it'd be nice, like I say, to be able to sing to them. You know, we're well. well I'm sure some imaginative chant will be born out of that <laughs> night if we have qualified for the Champions League, and obviously they won't be in it. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. But I'm looking forward to Monday night, and I've I've got uh, I've got a good feeling about it because you know not only have we broke loads of records, but the law of averages says, you know, the more times you... The, I know I say this every year when we go to Stamford Bridge, but <laughs> the law of averages says we've got to win there soon. Yes. Yeah. I just hope it's on Monday. Well, we saw this at Man United, didn't we, a couple of seasons ago. We'd gone a similar length of time, you know, not winning there, and it, it just takes a quality team to turn up, and maybe we, it's as simple as that. Maybe we just haven't had a team good enough in the last 20, 20 or so years to, to win there, whereas this season, I've got no doubt in my mind, and I'm sure the team are the same, I'm sure everybody listening out there is the same. We've got no doubt in, in any of our minds that we have the quality now to go there and get a result um, and shut Chelsea out, which is the mate, the first you know, first thing to do, and then score the goals at the other end. Uh, absolutely no doubt we can go there and get a result. I tell you what, lads, we're running out of time, so let's get some predictions, shall we? Let's go across the board, as always, and get some predictions. Um, Rick, first up. Well, I feel like I've got to say a positive role, result just to kind of keep it alive. So <laughs> I'm going to go 2-1 to Spurs. A two, nice 2-1 two Spurs, and um, hoping it's not a nervy 2-1. I hope we get the, uh, the goals nice and early. Uh, Ian? Totally agree with Rick. Two one Spurs. Two one Spurs. Now, now, John, are you going to buck the um, the trend here? Are you going to break the habit of a lifetime, <laughs> and uh, or are you going to go for a six one? I think I think I'll have to lose the six ones till the, till next season. <laughs> Maybe we'll get one in pre-season or something. You never know. We'll take that. We'll take that. No, I'm, I'm going for I'm going for one nil away win on Monday, and it's going to be a a late sickening blow for Chelsea. Oh. Oh, I tell you, wouldn't that be lovely, eh? Wouldn't that be lovely? Um, nice winner at the end there. So there you have it. That's the predictions of the Eastburs team for Monday night. Um, that's the Eastburs podcast for this week, guys. We'll be back after the Chelsea game next weekend. Don't forget to have your say on the podcast this week via our social media and look out for our extra time episode, which this week will go out on Saturday. And get involved, of course, on that Eastburs talking point. Um, what has been more influential on our season? Is it Kane's goals or all the world's defending? good one for you to get your teeth into this week guys um next week we'll be back um jason hopefully be back on the podcast with us next week uh, this week from john from ian from ricky and myself have a great week guys and as always come on you spurs